While atheists often view themselves as champions of reason, reason is one of the most inescapable problems for atheism. Unfortunately, atheists usually don't realize it because they haven't followed their beliefs through to the obvious conclusion. Human beings tend to trust our cognitive faculties, which is simply a fancy term for the processes and abilities we use to form our beliefs. These processes and abilities include things like memory, moral judgment, reason, and so on. Of course, we understand that our cognitive faculties aren't perfect. We understand, for instance, that our memories are incomplete and sometimes wrong. Nevertheless, we assume that if we carefully think through a problem, we can get to the truth. So the general reliability of our cognitive faculties is something we take for granted. However, when we adopt a belief that undermines this general reliability, we're no longer justified in believing that our cognitive faculties are generally reliable. If, for example, I come to believe that a mad scientist has put a chip in my brain that controls my memories, I'm no longer justified in trusting my memories. If I become convinced that a psychiatrist has spent years hypnotizing me and manipulating my moral judgments, I'm no longer justified in trusting my moral judgments. Atheism is one of the beliefs that undermine the general reliability of our cognitive faculties. Here I mean atheism in the strong sense of naturalism, the view that the natural world is all that exists. In a softer sense, an atheist could simply reject the god of traditional theism while believing in some lesser deity. But most people who call themselves atheists don't mean that they reject one particular god. They mean that they reject all gods and anything supernatural, leaving them with the natural world. It's this strong sense of atheism, naturalism, which undermines the reliability of our cognitive faculties. To understand why, let's consider a few remarks by some of the great minds of the past. In the first of his Meditations on First Philosophy, French philosopher and mathematician René Descartes is deliberately undermining the reliability of his cognitive faculties because he wants to know if there's anything that can't possibly be doubted, no matter how defective our faculties are. Descartes says that an omnipotent deity, if he wanted to, could deceive us all the time. But then Descartes anticipates an objection. What if an atheist says, I don't believe in God or demons, so there's no powerful being that could be deceiving me? Descartes quickly dismisses the atheist by insisting that the weaker the cause, the weaker the effect. He writes, Perhaps there may be some who would prefer to deny the existence of so powerful a God rather than believe that everything else is uncertain. Let us not argue with them, but grant them that everything said about God is a fiction. According to their supposition, then, I have arrived at my present state by fate, or chance, or a continuous chain of events, or by some other means. Yet since deception and error seem to be imperfections, the less powerful they make my original cause, the more likely it is that I am so imperfect as to be deceived all the time. In other words, if my cognitive faculties are the result of natural processes, I clearly can't say that they were intended to get me to the truth. So what kind of confidence can I have that my reason isn't constantly leading me astray? The Scottish philosopher David Hume has a partial response. According to Hume, we can keep our reasoning well grounded by limiting it to everyday affairs where our experiences serve as a constant check on our reasoning. But this means that we should recognize our limitations and avoid reasoning about matters that go beyond our experience. Hume says, The imagination of man is naturally sublime, delighted with whatever is remote and extraordinary, and running, without control, into the most distant parts of space and time in order to avoid the objects which custom has rendered too familiar to it. A correct judgment observes a contrary method, and avoiding all distant and high enquiries confines itself to common life and to such objects as fall under daily practice and experience, leaving the more sublime topics to the embellishment of poets and orators, or to the arts of priests and politicians. Since the claim that God doesn't exist or that the natural world is all that exists are paradigm examples of claims that go far beyond our daily experience, the only reasoning we should employ on such topics is attempting to show people that they don't really know what they're talking about. 
Hume did precisely this against theism in his dialogues concerning natural religion, but it's important to note that he would have taken a similar stance against naturalism. Human reason, according to Hume, just isn't equipped for such matters and should therefore remain silent on them. In part 8 of the dialogues, Hume presents a simple theory of evolution to account for the appearance of design in nature. But he's almost joking when he offers his theory. It's mainly an attempt to show that all sorts of wild theories might explain order and complexity, so we shouldn't pretend to understand how we got here. A more serious argument for evolution would come along the following century. In 1859, English geologist and natural historian Charles Darwin published his most famous work on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races and the struggle for life. Darwin argued that within a population of organisms, some organisms will have advantages over others and will therefore be better equipped to survive and reproduce. The offspring of the organisms that survive and reproduce will carry on the advantageous traits, and over a period of many millions of years, we can achieve the biological diversity we see around us. Years after he published on the origin of species, Darwin began noticing a problem. If our cognitive faculties are the product of natural selection acting on variations within populations, then our cognitive faculties were selected because they helped our ancestors survive and reproduce. The kinds of traits that help us survive and reproduce have to do with finding food, finding shelter, and finding a mate. So the abilities we have were selected by the exact same process that gave other animals their abilities. How could such a process give us cognitive faculties that can be trusted with questions of philosophy or theology or ethics? Darwin lamented, With me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind which has been derived from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind, if there are any convictions in such a mind? Our cognitive faculties may be more advanced in certain ways than the cognitive faculties of a monkey, but the mechanisms that produced them are the same in both cases. We wouldn't trust the convictions of a monkey's mind. Why trust our own? Because we're smarter? How much smarter? Enough for us to explain ultimate reality or the origin of the universe or the origin of life? How in the name of common sense can we trust our mutant berry finding ability to do things that go vastly beyond what it was selected to do? Putting all this together, we can see why belief in naturalism undermines the cognitive faculties required to affirm naturalism. As Darwin eventually noticed, if our faculties were selected to find food and find a mate, we have no basis for trusting our convictions, and this obviously includes the conviction that the natural world is all that exists. So if we affirm naturalism, we have to reject naturalism. If naturalists choose to dogmatically cling to naturalism, even though it can't possibly be defended, then taking the advice of Hume, they would do well to limit their reasoning to tasks immediately related to everyday life. And following Descartes, if naturalists aren't happy being so confined by their weak cause, perhaps it's time to believe in a more powerful cause. For more on the argument from reason, click on this epic video.